Okay, so um, this is going to be a bit of a different uh, talk from what you're used to. Um, and we're going to talk about medical ethics and the Bible. Outside it says Bible teaching about me medical ethics. I suppose if I were to summarize it up uh, in, in one phrase, I, I think the answer is that there is no right or wrong answer. And I'll, I'll hopefully you'll understand what I mean by that as we go along. So um, I, I'm a surgeon by profession and I deal with very difficult decisions um, on a day-to-day -day basis and um, today we're not going to be frightened off by difficult decisions. I, I want us to uh, take them on head on and um, um, discuss them together. Uh, but I do want to give a health warning uh, because they are sensitive subjects. I don't know what <coughs> sensitive issues there are in this room, okay? Um, and some of these things will be upsetting, all right? Um, and you will, I expect, feel quite emotionally drained by the end of the, the, the session. If you feel upset, please feel free to, to go in the other room and just uh, leave the session if you, if you don't feel you can cope with it. Um, I want you to take part if you can because I don't want to be doing all the talking um, because that's not the, really the way we'll learn I think we'll learn more from hearing what each other feels about things so medical dilemmas then well medical dilemmas affect all of us at different times I, some of us uh, I know Debbie's here, uh, work in the profession and uh, we um, come across these dilemmas and difficult decisions on a regular basis but we, if you like, are one step uh, detached because they're not our personal dilemmas. Um, and when it hits you as a family or as an individual it becomes very personal and very difficult because there are situations that modern medicine offers um, or, or pr the situations that modern medicine puts us in which gives us a choice where in the old days we didn't have a choice. Nature would take its course and there would be no choice. But these days we have lots of choices and those choices are difficult. Should we use modest, modern medicine to the full? Or should we just let nature take its course? Um, you know, that's a fundamental uh, issue that we have to decide upon for ourselves. And there's no right or wrong answer. There are a few principles, um, if you like, going back to my invitation this morning, um, there are words of wisdom contained in scriptures that we need to apply to these difficult situations there isn't a verse that says you should do this or should do that but there are uh, principles contained in the scriptures that will help us as individuals to find the correct uh, way forward and of course we would always when we're um, facing a difficult dilemma we would always go to God in prayer um, and we have confidence that God will give us the answer to our prayer we study the scriptures for the answer and sometimes there are verses which are relevant and that will help us. We would always, I'm sure, discuss with wiser and, and uh, with wiser brothers and sisters, and perhaps people who've been there and have got the t-shirt as it were. Um, we would also probably go and discuss it with the medical profession to see what the medical advice is, but ultimately we have control um, over our own bodies and nobody has the right to do anything to us without our permission and so we have to make the choice for ourselves. And ultimately we have to make a choice and have faith. Have faith that it's God's will if we're doing it in a prayerful uh, way. And whatever is the outcome, we have to accept it as God's will. Okay? I'm sorry, I've had to kick, kick it across you. If you want to move, uh, 
Um, okay, so this is the first example, if you like. Where do we use modern medicine to the full, uh, which is one extreme, or do we not interfere with nature? So let me give you an example of this one. So maybe you have a you go down with pneumonia, okay, and the doc your doctor says, well, I'd like to give you some antibiotics, and that will cure your pneumonia. Um, so should you have the antibiotics, or should you let nature take its course, whereby you might actually die from the pneumonia? Pneumonia is a very common cause of death, even today, and uh, certainly used to be before the days of antibiotics. So I would suspect that most of you in this room would take the antibiotics. I may be wrong, I may be making an assumption. If we go to the other extreme, uh, using modern medicine to the full, I'm a bit ugly, I could do with a bit of uh, cosmetic <laughs> surgery to iron out the cracks, if you like, and <coughs> make me look more beautiful. Um, so should I use modern medicine, which can offer that sort of cosmetic surgery, to, to, look, to look, look younger than I am? <laughs> um, or is that going too far? Okay, and that's, so that's probably beyond where most people would feel comfortable. There may be some in this room who feel that's appropriate. Uh, I'm not one of those. And so there is a limit to how far I, as a doctor, would want to go in terms of using modern medicine. Um, and you won't be surprised to know that I tend to feel, go there where most, most of the medical profession would say that's a reasonable thing to do, uh, but not further. <coughs> um, but you may feel uh, that you'd be a lot more selective you may say, well, okay, I might take antibiotics if I've got pneumonia, but going into hospital for an operation, maybe that's not where I feel comfortable. And we all feel, we all would draw our line somewhere differently. Okay, that doesn't mean that there's a right answer or a wrong answer. Okay, now, we've only got one session today, and we can only cover two of these subjects. I'm going to give you the choice which two you want to cover, um, and if you don't choose, then I'll choose. Okay, so the first one is about abortion and contraception. Okay, so if you were, um, if you or let's say somebody close to you uh, was pregnant with a child, would there ever be a situation where you would? have an ab what you would recommend an abortion okay maybe the child is handicapped maybe the child doesn't have a ch chance of living when that pregnancy comes to an end maybe that child has a slight abnormality <coughs> which is uh, you don't really want to, them to live with that for the rest of their life is contraception uh, right in God's eyes. So that's one question which we could, could, could consider if you choose to. The second one is medical inter intervention for conception. There's a lot of couples who cannot have children and that can be a great sorrow, particularly um, in a community like ours, which is very much a family-based community, and in, to some degree there's an expectation that you will have your quiverful, if you like. So, um, but about one in six people can't have children. One in six couples can't have children. But there is help from the medical profession. So that's something we could consider if you want. And the third one is blood and organ donation. Um, I'm somebody who wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for a blood transfusion. And there may be others in this room whose life has been saved um, because of a blood transfusion. Uh, there are ex examples of people who, whose lives have been saved and transformed by the donation of a kidney, um, or, uh, or another organ for that matter. But is it right in God's eyes for us to donate our organs or give blood? Is it something that as a Christian we should be doing those things? So that's something we could discuss. 
And then the final one is ending life in a dying patient, otherwise known as euthanasia. Well, it's, it's, there's more to it than euthanasia, but euthanasia comes across in, in, in there. So, you know, is life sacred at all, all costs, or are there times when it is better to let a patient die? or even actively help somebody to die, to put them out of their misery. So those are the four choices. As you can see, they're all difficult, emotional subjects in their own right. But I need you to let me know. Just If, you, if, you, if you'd like to do any one of them, just let, say now. I have to do organ donation. Okay, fine. So we'll do organ donation then. So we have a choice of one other. The last one. Okay, so we'll do the last two. <coughs> Fantastic. Now, just bear with me a <coughs> second so I can skip through. Okay. So, um, we're going to discuss blood and organ donation and then ending life in a dying patient. And we're going to use, for blood and organ donation, we're going to use this the straight line and, and where you stand on that line, okay? I'm afraid for the last one, the ending life um, scenario, it's a bit more complicated than that, but we'll come to that in a bit. So I want to spend most of my time on the last one, because th this, this one is a sort of uh, an easier uh, one. But wherever we draw our line, we must remember the scriptural principle that God is in control. That, uh, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, 28, we, we know that all things work together for good uh, to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And that's us, isn't it? Okay? We all believe that God is in control of our lives. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to have an easy life that we're going to be free of any uh, difficult decisions and dilemmas in our lives. Um, but it's how we deal with those dilemmas and difficult decisions that is important. And that's what I want us to think about. A little bit of background. Um, so when we're looking at blood, about 2.1 million blood donations occur uh, every year in the UK. They are essential for modern day medical practice. I wouldn't be able to do the complex surgery that I do um, without having blood available. Where possible, we try not to spill blood and you know, some of the operations I do, I lose less than 50 mils of blood. But sometimes it doesn't go quite so well and the patient would die unless they have a blood transfusion. Okay. So, as you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that we sh should have, we should use blood. And they keep banging on about blood sparing techniques. We use those routinely, believe me. We, you know, blood is not something that we, we uh, take for granted or, or deal with lightly. The problem is that there is a shortage of blood. And uh, I was chairman of the Hospital Blood Transfusion Committee for a while in Nottingham and the, uh, every now and then we'd have a, an alert come up saying stocks are down to less than two days. And you know, that would be at certain times of the year, perhaps, or if there had been a particular um, run on, on the blood for any particular reason. What about organ donation? Um, well, most organs come from deceased donors, so people who lose their life um, but are kept alive in the hospital on a, a life support machine and um, then the, the decision is that they're, they're unfortunately not going to survive and then the question is um, would they like to donate their organs and obviously if they're carrying a donor card or they're on the transplant on, on the donor register um, then, and then the family agreement, then they can, off, they can give their uh, organs. 
interestingly in, in Wales recently you may be aware that there's now an opt-out system so you're assumed to be happy to give your organs unless you carry a card which says I don't want to uh, give my organs that's a recent change in, in the law now there were over a thousand live donor transplants um, in 2010-2011, mainly kidneys. So uh, somebody with two healthy kidneys, you only actually need one. So you can live a normal life on one kidney. And sometimes if, if a loved one of yours has um, renal failure, you can transform their life by giving them a kidney. Uh, but obviously there's risk to you, isn't there? The average waiting time for a kidney transplant is over three years, and some patients die whilst on the transplant list, waiting for their transplant. Uh, and yet the success rate is over 85%, and lives are completely transformed by um, an organ donation. <coughs> so these are the options that you have. Remember that don't interfere with nature. Clearly, if you don't believe we should interfere with nature, if you have um, kidney failure, you just accept that you're going to die, or you might accept dialysis. Um, over on the far side, it may be that you say, well, yes, let's embrace this. God has given us the technology to save lives. Um, so uh, you might say, well, I would be... Uh, not only a, a live, uh, not only a donor for my organs when I die, but I'd be very happy to give an organ, uh, a kidney, to a relative who needs it. Or you may even be, and there are patients, uh, there are people who will give a, a, a kidney to someone they don't know, to a stranger, okay, because it's a, they're doing their bit for humanity. How would you feel about that? big ask isn't it okay you may feel let's go back to the bottom end you may feel well yes I'll accept blood if I need blood then I'll accept blood uh, but I'm not having anybody else's organs and I'm not going to give anything of mine or you might say well I'll accept <coughs> blood and organs if I'm going to benefit that's great but you won't get anything off me okay you might say well I would give blood but actually I don't. Okay, Let's see if I can use my pointer. I would give blood, but actually I don't. You might say, well, I, I would give my organs, but actually I'm not, I'm not on the organ uh, donor register. Um, you might have a get out of jail card by saying, well, I, I'm unable to be a, a, a donor or give blood because I have a particular medical condition. But let's put that to one side a minute. You may say, well, I, I do give blood, but I'm not an organ donor. You might say, well, I, I am an organ donor, but I wouldn't give blood. Or you might say, well, I, I am both. Um, I do, do give blood, and I am an organ donor. And as I say, the, the, the extreme is um, somebody who is prepared to give one of their kidneys for... Um, somebody else now let's so I'm going to ask you to make your decision in a minute after a little bit of discussion but let's put a bit of background in because one of the concerns about organ donation is how do they know that you're really dead you know if you go into hospital and there's a shortage of, of organs they might say oh let's just let this one die and we can use their organs now that might happen in some countries in the world, but I can assure you that it doesn't happen in the UK. I think I can assure you that. <laughs> yeah, I can assure you that. I'm not really joking. Um, so they won't just let you die if, um, if they know you're on on the organ register, uh, organ donation register. Okay. So don't worry about that. And there are very clear ways in which people. Um, and that, that we, which doctors work out whether you're brain dead or not. There's a clear definition. So, again, don't worry about that. Now, I'm going to show you an embarrassing photograph. Um, 
so I'm in there somewhere and this is a bunch of Christy Dolkins going on holiday together and as it happens, purely by chance, there are four sets of siblings in that picture and we didn't know this at the time but one of those poor people was going into kidney failure okay and eventually uh, had, had to be on dialysis all the time and uh, he wrote around to his family asking if anyone would be prepared to offer, them, offer him a kidney and one of his brothers who's also in the picture there gave him a kidney that takes a bit of doing doesn't it I've got four brothers Okay, it wasn't me again. <laughs> I've got four <laughs> brothers, Spares. and they can't, they can't hold that one. Um, but I'm not sure how much, whether I love my brothers enough to give them a kidney. I think perhaps for my children that would be a different question, or a different answer to the question. But how would you feel if, you, if that was your dilemma? Okay. Are there any Bible verses that help us here? Well, there's this one in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, so freely give. Okay? Now, you might say, oh, well, we don't have the Holy Spirit gifts. We're not in a position to heal the sick. And quite, quite right. But actually, if you have, a, you have the ability to give blood or to be an organ donor, and in doing that, you can heal the sick and actually save a life. So does that change things? And, and remember in the bottom of our uh, graph where it says I would receive blood and, and organs, but I'm not going to give mine to anyone, is that freely giving? No. You know, so maybe that should touch our conscience. You know, it's all very well to say yeah, we expect when we go into hospital if we need blood to be able to have it, and we would be very pleased to be able to accept. Or you, I'm assuming you'd be very pleased to accept somebody else's organ if you needed it to save your life. Therefore, if we're prepared to accept it of other people, should we not be prepared to give it as well? We know the Bible teaching about death and resurrection, don't we? And we know that when we die, there's nothing sacred about our bodies. Our bodies are just going to return to the dust. And so whilst they are still viable, why not use our organs for the good of mankind to save somebody else's life? We, you know, because we've only got one kidney or even no kidneys doesn't mean we can't go into the kingdom of God, does it? <coughs> And this is the verse that the Jehovah Witnesses uh, use to say we shouldn't have blood. Genesis 9 verse 4, But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. I don't think that's got anything to do with uh, blood donation. It's about eating meat containing blood. Now, we can debate that if anyone wants to uh, raise that. I, I don't know if anyone can think of any other verses that might be relevant to this discussion <coughs> because we're moving now to, to discussion time. I'm so not playing devil's advocate. Okay. But what about the principle under the law where God said you have to get everything mixed up like you couldn't mix wool and linen and animals and humans couldn't have relationships and sexual relationships and the whole principle that underlines that that they had to be holy as God was holy mm -hmm. and if you start taking each of those organs mm -hmm. particularly possibly blood as well but organs but you're actually using the biblical phrase causing confusion okay so does anybody want to come back on, on that uh, point mm -hmm. you didn't hear it so so I think I'm right in saying so the point is that um, under the law there shouldn't be mixing or of animals and humans um, and uh, using that same principle of, of not so in confusion that, that uh, you know we are our own bodies and we shouldn't be accepting bits of other people's bodies uh, and perhaps even blood as well. Is that 
sort more or less. But that's between mankind, isn't it? Uh, all the donation, it's not between animals and mankind. Mm. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, so we're talking about <coughs> within human. Uh, of course, some medicines are um, yeah, animal-based, animal based, um, and uh, it's a monoclonal antibody treatment which targets a particular part <coughs> of the body. That can be derived from a mouse or a, a, an animal of mm. some sort mm. uh, in order to develop that. So we're, I suppose you're using a verse which is a very, which a law, law based verse which is there, but we're taking it now into the medical sphere, turning it around, becoming really high tech about it, and does that verse still apply? I guess that's, that's the question. Okay. Anybody got any thoughts about that or any of the points that I've raised? I think if the hygiene laws, blood is known as a, um, a carrier, isn't it? Yes. Not, it doesn't carry just nutrients, it carries other things. Diseases. Diseases, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So in the hygiene laws, you know, there was very strict things not to pass on, especially with um, diseases that could be passed from man to man. Um, and I think that probably, the jo- I don't know, but probably the Jehovah's Witnesses are on that line. Th- you know? that's, uh, it's, that's not their un- fundamental principle, but it's, they use that as an additional reason. Mm-hmm. So there is, and we, you know, when we do give blood to patients, we have to warn them about a very small risk of transmittable uh, diseases. Mm-hmm. And certainly um, HIV, um, or AIDS was transmitted in the 80s mm-hmm. to haemophiliacs particularly because they had lots of do- uh, blood uh, requirements and so there are patients who contracted HIV from um, blood donation. Now blood is screened for all the known diseases mm-hmm. and um, but we can't, tell, we can't say what disease we're yet to discover. Um, and there is a there is a s- very small but real risk of uh, transmission of uh, disease. So that's a good point. Okay, and of course we can't just give any blood to anybody. There's blood groups, and um, that we have to you have to have the right blood group, otherwise you'll die potentially of a of a, a, a reaction to somebody else's blood. But all those things are again taken into consideration. Okay. Um, I'm just going to get rid of this one which some people use as a get out. Um, So there is a limit to age and uh, blood and and organ donation. So uh, blood donation, if you're over the age of 60, um, you can't become a new uh, uh, blood donor. Um, if you've been giving blood for years and you're regarded as a safe donor, then you can continue to give blood until you're up to the age of 70. As far as organ donation is concerned, the older that you are, the less organs are likely to be, you are able to donate those organs because clearly they have a life expectancy. But um, patients without a kidney will will still do better accepting a kidney from somebody in their 70s um, and even even like a cornea transplant you can uh, donate e- into your 80s. So age alone is not a, a reason why not. And let's imagine we're all young and elderly. Okay, so I need you to make your decision now. But let's have a bit of discussion first. Does anybody want to throw up any um, questions or uh, opinions that we can discuss to help us make our decision.
people are thinking Since about that. <laughs> Since that. So should we should we ration um, organ uh, donation to those who are worthy? Mm. I suppose like what giving a liver to an alcoholic that continues being an yeah, alcoholic. So exactly. George Best is a good example of that, isn't yeah. it? He, <coughs> the, under the NHS, he probably wouldn't have received a, a liver mm. transplant because he wasn't really dry. And that, pro that was proved to be the, the correct answer, really, because he continued to, mm. continued to drink and didn't, his second liver didn't last very long. That can but be a thin end of the wedge, though, can't it? That you then define the group and become unworthy. And that can become racist, sexist, uh, ageist. Yeah. Um, Lifestyle issues, or even inherited disorders, yep. and human rights. Yeah. Well, we're already pieces in it, it's, it's like, um, NHS resources to already. You're only allowed certain operations if you're below this BMI. If you're not allowed to have IVF if you um, have had a child with a previous marriage, mm. even if it was not your, if it was you're the man and the, your ex-wife had a child. Um, you're now not allowed to have IVF, so we're already rationing some things. So at the NHS there is a degree of rationing, um, and that's based on probability. So, you know, you aren't, aren't going to offer a liver to somebody who continues to drink alcohol for the reason that they're going to destroy their, their next liver. Um, and yeah, the, and the organs, and yeah. um, you want to give it to the person who's going to get the most use out of it. Yeah. I, in, in, I mean, in the case of blood donating blood and giving organs apart from the top right hand corner there's anonymity mm -hmm. and if you if you give blood um, you know it goes away in a bottle and that's it and you have no control over who it's used for which is quite right and I know there have been cases where people say what's well, go to this group of people you know it's you know, unacceptable but so you, so that's not really an influencing decision the decision if you, you want to give blood uh, out of many years and I've asked I'll, I'll, I'll give blood okay uh, over many years, and I'm happy to do that, and I'd happily really receive blood. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so there's no question of morals, ethics in it. Yeah, so, the, I think, so, so I think that's you know. So I, I would let's go back against your question and say actually, the um, we're not. It's not for us to judge who we should give the blood or organs to. It's the principle: should we be prepared to give to fellow man? Yeah. Okay, which is your point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I would like people to stand up now and, and let's imagine that number one is the door there and number nine is that corner there and go and stand in a, in a line which is where you feel you are. If you, don't want to, if you don't want to get up and move, that's fine. I'm too old. Go on, <laughs> go on. Go on. Go on. If you genuinely can't move, that's fine. Yeah, you can move, but you Yeah, I'll go there. Dear me, where there. am I going to go? <laughs> right, the you can't, can't just sit and listen to this session, I'm afraid. I think I think I am. You see emotional issues. I think I am. 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 I think I but if, if otherwise, I'm, I'm going to come and ask you why you're standing where you are. And if you feel comfortable to ask, that's fine. If you don't feel comfortable, just say, go and ask somebody else. <laughs> so, Ira, why are you standing there? So, the reason I'm standing here, I was thinking a minute ago, I was reading in Ecclesiastes, and it says, a living dog is better than a dead lion. So yes. when you're dead, you can't live, there's no hope. Mm. So it could be right up that end, because surely if you can do something to keep someone alive, they've got hope of salvation still. However, I am terribly squeamish. <laughs> Even sitting here at the front of the minute, I'm feeling a bit, you know. <laughs> so, the idea of actually giving blood or giving it an organ donation <laughs> is terrifying. Yep. However, if it was a relative or somebody I knew who needed an organ and I was able to help, maybe I'd move up the thing. But that's not really a question I want to answer unless I absolutely have to. Okay, that's a good answer. Thank you very much. So, just the fact that you can be terribly squeamish about having a needle stuck into you might be the reason why you're down there, not because you have any scriptural reason against it. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you why you're? Yeah. Wh what number are you at? Um, at seven. Okay. I have given blood before, but I'm not allowed to anymore. Okay. Um. We'll but I would that. otherwise 
I am on the open data register, so I would okay. not bother to All right. Um, and what about if, um, you, so you're standing there, but you're not standing at number nine? I suppose I could stand there, yeah. Okay. I, would, I wouldn't mind. Mark has renal failure, for example. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. do, yeah. Because I was healthy enough yeah. and I was allowed to. Yeah. Mm. I suppose I just stopped because I didn't know whether I had to be able to give blood to get up, up, <laughs> the, <laughs> up the right steps. <laughs> Well, yeah. um, let, I, I don't know the answer to your the particular reason why you can't give blood, but um, let's assume that that's not a barrier to you yeah. giving an organ. Okay. Um, who'd like to give their reason why they are where they are? So what's your name again? Joyce. So Joyce is going to tell us why she's standing at number four. Did you say? Yeah, I would give blood, but I don't. I'm just not got around to it. Too old, Joyce now. <laughs> okay, but that's that's true of a lot of us. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and actually I'm there because I have offered to give blood, but I never got round to it. Yeah. Um, and you know there were a couple of times where I signed up to give him blood, um, but it wasn't needed in that in that situation, and I I never done it. Yeah. And that's to my shame, but that's what that's the reality. Yeah. So go on, okay. carry on. My family do, but okay. What about organs? Are you on the transplant list? No. The register? No. Okay. How do you feel about that right now? When I'm dead, it doesn't bother me. Okay. <laughs> so if somebody showed you how to put your um, sign up to the transplant yeah, register? Yeah, do it, yeah. Do okay. <laughs> Not that I'm putting pressure on you. <laughs> 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 so would, would you like to say why you're standing there? Um, Intellectually, I, I don't have a problem with doing either. I've never given blood as a, as a young woman. I wasn't allowed to, but I suspect that prohibition probably no longer exists. Um, the organ donation, I know Roger's very much in favour of it, and I don't know why I can't put a, a logical answer to it. It just doesn't feel right to do it, and, and, and it's an emotional thing, and I accept that. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say, I can't. I can't find a scriptural verse that sort of mm -hmm. backs that up. Okay. Um, again, only things like you've got to be very careful. You can't give blood to one from one human to another without checking that no, they're that's compatible. Right. Yeah. There's just something about the way God does things, mm -hmm. and that's. The, I know it's not logical, and I know it's not consistent. That just makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, probably, if Roger was ill or one of my children. Mm -hmm or grandchildren, then I'd be probably up there with Debbie and Roger. Yeah, yeah. And I'd, I'd somewhere screw up the coach. I, I, I'm really squeamish. Yeah. Um, so it, it really, it's, it's about when the chips are down and you've got somebody who's desperate for your blood or your organ or even your bone marrow. Yeah, it. You'd probably give it, yeah. yeah. But, but actually, it's ne you've never been But, but also the, the thought that somebody, I don't know whether Roger Harris was on the car. No, he didn't when we were younger. But if something happened to him, they came to me and said, can we cut him up and take bits out of him? <laughs> <laughs> because that's what he's announced to. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, that's, that's but that's a bit... Okay, that's everyone, that's everyone sit down, to. if you would. Thank you very much. <coughs> well, that's a very good point, um, you know, and that's why we tend not to take organs right. um, from somebody who's in that situation <laughs> without the relatives being in agreement <coughs> too, because the, pers the person who's dying, they're not feeling anything. They're not going to know anything. Their, their body's going to corrupt in the grave or they're going to be cremated but the relative has to live with either giving or not gi agreeing to give the, the organs so I don't know if you know this but there is a sister who's a, a, a sister in Christ who um, had to make that decision and her, her husband was on a ventilator was brain dead and he he worked in the medical profession and he made it very clear to her that if he died he wanted to give his organs and so she agreed to that happening and uh, that was a few years ago she was just as traumatized by it all as any of us would be um, and she has since met some of the people who benefited from that and she now stands up in front of thousands of people and will tell her story um, because she believes it was such the right decision and she 
and, and she 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 happens to be Welsh, and so she's involved in the in the opting out scheme. Um, and she tells people about what happened to her husband, who was a brother in Christ, and she also tells them about her faith. And uh, you know, these two things. Sorry. These two things. Yeah, yeah. No, not that that's a reason yeah. for doing it. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, I just want, I thought I'd just let you know that. If you do <laughs> feel <laughs> uh, that you want to, uh, it's not a campaign, if you do feel, <laughs> if you do feel your conscience has been pricked um, and you think, well, I have never done it, but there's no reason why I shouldn't, then you can. And that's the website. Okay, let's move on. So that was the easy one. Okay. This can is the I more. Just say that to my knowledge, there are members of our society, our, our Christian group, that are really against giving blood and organs, mm -hmm. and they they really think on the lines of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I didn't know really knew that, but I've come up okay. against them. Okay, so there. I would say that I've done this sort of talk in, in, yes. in front of lots of different people, and your reaction to this issue is fairly typical of the majority but there occasionally is somebody who's standing in yes. that bottom corner yes. saying that I don't believe in it at all okay mm -hmm. and sometimes it, they haven't got a really they haven't got a scriptural reason it's just more of a gut feel I haven't come across mm -hmm. a, a, a logical scriptural reason for it is but it possibly um, a reason that to do with the resurrection so what would the reason be to do with the resurrection? I don't know. People feeling that you, you've been put into the ground, uh, the, the dust is there, and, and it has to come back together somehow to, to resurrect. But it, it, that leaves out DNA and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can't imagine that when we're, we're rejuvenated to exactly. life that we would be missing the exactly. organs that we've given away. No, exactly. But it's exactly. in spirit, hasn't it? Because actually what's written in the spirit, who was it? Brother Jim Vickers, some years ago, when uh, DNA was first considered, went quite deeply into this and said that um, obviously what is written in God's book of life is not that you've got <laughs> blonde hair or whatever else it is, but, but your DNA, what makes you? Yeah, absolutely. Mm, because the dust that you turn to. Mm. Mm, and I turn to, he's going to be blown all over the place. Oh, go, well, who knows? Full of DNA. But it's the DNA that is important. And, and, and the knowledge that God has of our particular makeup for each particular person that matters. Now, has that got something to do, do you think? A misunderstanding of that has something to do with people feeling a bit queasy about giving organs and things mm. like that. Okay, well... Um, that's an interest, very interesting point, and I'm not going to answer it, or I'm not going to give you my opinion on that, um, other than to say that there isn't a right or wrong answer here. Yeah. It, is a, it is an answer which you have to come to for yourself, and you have to feel comfortable with your stance on it, um, and what the scriptures guide you to say and, and do. What I would say is that being in, in ignorance of it is no longer an option, mm. as I've told you about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. And when we come to the meeting, we talk about death quite often, but death is a very distressing and upsetting thing to really consider in detail. We are going to have to consider it for this, and uh, if anyone's recently bereaved, this might not be the right session for you. And so I was told uh, Martin said he didn't think there was anyone in that situation right now. But um, if you don't feel you can cope with it, then as I say, please feel free to go and make yourself a cup of tea. So death can be sudden. And when it's sudden, it's, it's a shock. You don't even have a chance to say goodbye to your loved one. Um, and the only thing you can really console yourself is that they didn't suffer. Or death can be a very slow, long, prolonged suffering. And yes, you can say your goodbyes, and you can prepare for it, but it's in the midst of all this terrible suffering, 
and often the suffering takes over and we never actually get round to saying our goodbyes or else we don't want to confront the fact that we're dying now God's law on death is very clear isn't it thou shalt not kill how more straightforward can you get than that but if we look at the word kill it's um, it, is, it is murder it is to dash in pieces to kill another human being especially to murder to put to death, to kill, to slay and we're not talking about this we're talking about uh, euthanasia we're talking about a merciful assisting someone to end their life because they're in such a lot of suffering and distress so can you apply that same thou shalt not kill to that uh, situation in uh, Romans it says uh, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder you shall not steal, you shall not co covet and any other commandment are summed up in this word you shall love your neighbour as yourself love does no wrong to a neighbour therefore love is the fulfilling of the law Okay, and yet if your neighbour is pleading with you to help them <coughs> to end their life because there's nothing to live for and they're racked with pain and suffering are you not showing love to your neighbour by mercifully assisting them to die it may be that they can't do it for themselves now there is a commandment uh, from Titus chapter 3 verse 1 put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates to be ready to, to uh, every good work so we should obey the law of the land and in this country it is illegal to carry out euthanasia but it, we know that there are some countries where it is legal and in fact there has been a big debate only in the last year about this very thing in the houses of Parliament. Let, let me just recap what the law is in the UK. So the definition of, you, uh, of euthanasia is allowing a patient to die peacefully and with dignity rather than keeping him or her alive at all costs. Okay, so that's what I mean. I'm not talking about granny, I want your inheritance. It's time you popped off now. <laughs> okay, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who's wrapped in pain and, and suffering and we're allowing them to die at a place and time of their choosing with mm -hmm. peace and dignity rather than keeping them alive um, where they're not in control of their bodily functions and they're wrapped in pain and, and they can't do anything for themselves. Passive euthanasia is allowing a patient to die and that is legally acceptable if the decision would be regarded as acceptable by a re responsible body of doctors so I have performed passive euthanasia okay I have allowed a patient to die I've given them morphine uh, to ease their pain knowing that a side effect of that pain uh, of that drug mm -hmm. may speed up their death I've never given someone an overdose a clear overdose to deliberately try and kill them although I have seen that done as a medical student okay uh, but I've never done that but I have given a drug like morphine to relieve suffering um, where the side effect can be that they, they die a little bit quicker than they would have done otherwise okay Debbie do you want to comment or not see what happens no okay <laughs> alright Active euthanasia involves a positive act and is a crime. So if I was to give someone a lethal injection that killed them, that would be a crime and I would be thrown off the medical register quite rightly and locked in prison. <coughs> but there's this double doctrine of double effect. So a doctor who administers a drug to relieve suffering, knowing that the incidental effect will be to speed up the death of the patient, um, they will escape liability if the patient is already dying um, and that that prescription is regarded as um, appropriate uh, by a 
response from a um, um, group of medical doctors. And the motivation behind it is about relieving suffering and um, not uh, causing them to die. Assisted suicide, which is voluntary euthanasia, is where the patient is asking you to uh, help them to die. So going into their house and they're begging with you, please put me out of my misery, just put this pillow to my head and I'll hold it there so I suffocate. And that in this country is a crime, um, but some you'll know that some people go off to Dignitas in Switzerland and um, to a special clinic where it is legal in that country and they are not generally not prosecuted in, uh, back in this country. So it's, it depends what country you live in as to whether it's legal or not. Withdrawal of treatment. Um, so this is where a competent, when I say a competent animal, I mean somebody who has the, his mind is working normally, they can choose, they can make the decision for themselves. If a competent adult refuses or requests the withdrawal of treatment, including artificial nutrition and hydration, that must be respected and to continue to treat that patient amounts to trespass, okay? So if a patient of mine who who's, um, has the ability to make that decision says, look, I want you to stop giving me a drip, I want you to stop feeding me through a tube and I want to just let, let nature take its course, then I have to go along with that even though I might think that's not the right decision for myself. Um, if that's what the patient wants, we have to um, go along with that. The patient has the ability and the right to decide. Okay. Um, yeah, li living wills are now legally binding. So um, if you now, in your right mind, say, if I develop an illness which is going to cause me to become unable to make my own decision, as well as wash myself and clean myself and all the rest of it, uh, so that I'm lying there in, in a vegetative state, you can write now a legal document which says, in that situation, I want you not to give me the treatment to, s to prolong my life, okay? And then the medical profession have to go along with that. Now this is where it becomes a little bit complicated. So. Now we're, instead of working in one dimension, we're working in two dimensions. Okay, so let's... <coughs> this line here on the uh, x-axis, if you like, is, is about suffering. So here we, we're leaving suffering, okay? Over there we're extending suffering. Um, this y-axis is to prolong life or to shorten life. So torture, for example, is both shortening life and extending suffering. Obviously, we're not advocating that. <laughs> a hip replacement, that relieves a lot of suffering. But it probably isn't going to make you live much longer. Okay? But it'll make the quality of your rest of your life a lot better. So that's relieving suffering, but it's not affecting the length of time you live for. Um, obviously the ideal medical intervention is up in the top left hand corner if we can do something to someone which cures them of their life threatening illness and relieves their suffering everyone's a winner okay that's what we that's what we're aiming for um, but actually some of these uh, 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 some of the interventions that we can do they might make us live longer but actually you could argue that they're just prolonging the suffering they're making the suffering worse and, and extending for a long period of time if we give pain relief to, to relieve suffering yes we're relieving suffering so we're, we're making a good impression on this axis but actually we might be shortening life slightly and then there are, are the group up here and these are these are decisions that doctors have to make um, 
for example, the dis decision uh, to do not resuscitate. So there, when you go into hospital, you sometimes will get asked the question, if your heart and lungs were to stop working, would you like us to resuscitate you? And normally you're asked that question, um, well, we, you should be routinely asked that question now, but we used to ask it of only of patients who we thought there's a pretty high risk that they're gonna their heart and lungs are going to stop working in a bit. Um, and we, do, we don't think it's the right thing as doctors to resuscitate. Because if we resuscitate, we might uh, prolong their life a little bit compared to there. So it goes up a fraction. But actually, we might just be extending their suffering. So not to resuscitate might shorten their life slightly, but it might alleviate their suffering. And similarly, the, the question about whether we continue to give or wh whether we give a drip and give fluids and nutrition artificially or not. And then decisions I have to make. Um, well, I might do your emergency operation and we'll give you, we'll give you um, the chance to wake up from your operation but we're not going to put you on a ventilator because if we do you'll, be, you'll never get off the ventilator and um, then you're just going to have a pr prolonged period of extending, extended suffering. But we'll give you the chance, a life-saving operation, and if you, if you manage to breathe okay afterwards and come through it, then great. If you don't, then unfortunately that's it for you. Or you say, well, let's do the operation and put them on a ventilator, but then are you, you're risking um, them being in that long period of time on a ventilator and seeing patients in intensive care for 90 <laughs> days, 120 days, you know, a long period of time, and, and it's a, there's a lot of suffering, but not a lot again. Okay. Um, so in a minute, I'm going to ask you to um, say where you feel you want to be. And I mean, you're not going to be able to stand anywhere because it's too complicated, but I want you to say what feels right for you. But there are a few uh, passages of scripture that are important to bring out here. In Ecclesiastes, there are these very poetic words, which I'm sure are referring to the human body coming to a natural end. Things start to stop working. Uh, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, <coughs> then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So if you like, it's a talking about the body de uh, deteriorating and eventually stopping working and uh, we die and we return to the dust and God takes the spirit back, if you like. Um, or the breath of life goes out of you, let's put it that way. And we know that's a very natural thing. We know we're all going to die. And um, most of the, most, for most people, there are signs of that before uh, it actually takes place. <coughs> <clears throat> but of course for us as brothers and sisters in Christ death is not the end death is just a sleep isn't it um, as it says in Thessalonians but we, we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no help for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so through Jesus God will bring those who have fallen asleep for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Those who have fallen asleep, of course, is those who have died, but they've fallen asleep because they are in the book of life. Their DNA is in God's book. And, and to God, they are alive, but for a, his command. Okay? All right. Let's have a bit of discussion then. What do people what do people think? Does it matter what our view <coughs> is about this situation? Has anybody nursed somebody who has been suffering terribly and uh, have asked them uh, to end it all? Anybody mm -hmm. want? Sorry? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you I am a, no, I, well, I'm a retired person. Okay. Yeah. Are you up to telling us what your views are? 
yeah, I mean, the thing is, myself, I used to pray secretly that God would take them, you know. But I, I think I'm with the passive one where um, I have been, I know it's happening, we give them more feed and it, it reacts the right way. Yeah. yeah. So you're, but you would relieve suffering, mm -hmm. and, uh, and if the side effect was that they would die that's right. a bit sooner, yeah. you'd be. Yeah. Yeah. That's, as a nurse, that's how you felt. Yeah. Especially, it's very, very difficult more in children. Yeah. More difficult completely, you know, because you cannot, especially very small babies and, and very young children, you can't communicate or soothe them or talk to them. And, you know, um, so it has to be a clinical thing. Mm -hmm. And um, but in my experience, the natural things happen pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Anybody else want to uh, say anything? In Ecclesiastes, there's obviously got a bit about like you know a time to be born and a time to die. But then there's also you know a time to kill and a time to heal. And I think part of me thinks, well, you know, God is in control, and so if something happens that and it's not going good for you in terms of dying, then God's sort of in control of that. But then I don't know how I would feel if it was then me and I was told, well, there's a treatment you could try and potentially you'd got an extra six months. Would you then say no because there's a, maybe that's my time now? Or do you think, well, actually, uh, maybe God's given me this option that would then give me another chance? And I don't know when you say, okay, that's and maybe that's when it becomes like if that six months would be horrendous and you w wouldn't actually have any positivity in you to be thinking about God and studying and so then you think well that six months isn't actually a useful time and so then you say okay but you might not know that so I don't know mm -hmm. when you then say okay so that yeah thank you for that so I guess the fundamental question is has God given us the medical advances that we have today as a gift to our generation or is it something that is something that we shouldn't have anything to do with yeah? um, and, and is it something that is a gift to our generation but we sh there is a limit to how far we take it you know, um, there is. You, you're right. There are experimental treatments that we don't know whether they're going to help or not, but they could be the next magic cure. And and so that's part of the reason why people are prepared who who are dying are prepared to try a, a, an unproven treatment. It might speed up their death, but it might cure them or might give them another six months or a year or two years. We don't know. Anybody else? I do feel that, it, that I mean, the first verse put the thou shalt not kill. The Bible doesn't actually just say that because two chapters later it's to given you the instructions of every opportunity where you would kill someone, for example, for blasphemy, or if they slept with an animal, or if they offered a child sacrifice. Then straight after it, thou shalt not kill, mm -hmm. the Bible's instruction will give all the situations where you should kill someone to follow God's commandments. So it's obviously a situational thing, and it is often to do with the reason you're doing it. So like you're saying that if you're killing somebody to prevent what could be a huge suffering for them, that's not a negative thing, I would say. Because the Bible often gives you scenarios where killing was actually at God's command. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more to do with where your head's at when you're doing it. Okay, fair enough. Of course, we're not under the law now. That's right. right. No, but, you, but if you're using that verse to say that we shouldn't in the first mm -hmm. place, the, the law itself doesn't agree with that verse. It's okay. situational. Okay. Um, I mean, looking at that board, I'm all over the shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and it is situational. I don't think I would want to be resuscitated. My caveat on that is if I was hit in the chest with a cricket ball, I'd want to be resuscitated. If I was ill to the point that my heart stopped, I wouldn't want to be resuscitated. Mm -hmm. And it is all situational. I'd love to be resuscitated if I was on a cardiac unit with a monitor. And someone saw me, you mm -hmm. 
and not, where there was a re- in yeah. other words, yeah. where there was yeah. a reasonable yeah. chance of it being successful. And yeah. and of course, on a there are some illnesses, and we're not going to go into detail, but there are some illnesses where the problem is with your heart rhythm, and there's a very good chance that if your if your heart stops that, and you're in the right place, that you can be successfully resuscitated and brought back to life. And I remember a little old brother at Newport meeting where I grew up, who used to be very proud of the fact that he died for, <laughs> <laughs> for a minute and, and was brought back to life, and he, he lived for another 15 years you know, um, and had a very good quality of life. Um, but of course, when as doctors, when we're making that difficult decision, we're not making it on the basis of um, rationing, okay? Um, we're making it on the basis of, of what is the most <coughs> humane and kind thing for that person because we really don't think that, that they would have a chance of um, living if, if, they were, if their heart and lungs were to stop. They're basically dying. And to call a crash team to uh, you know, jump up and down on their chest and put electric shocks through them isn't the most dignified way of dying. Um, and, and I think that's what, that's what we're talking about in that situation. So if I, like Debbie, if I was dying and there wasn't much prospect of me being resuscitated, I would not want people to try. And, I, you know, I've unfortunately been resuscitating people and have broken ribs and things like that and trying to get them back to life. And it's not dignified, it's not nice. But at the same time, you know, in the right situation for the right person, it, it can <laughs> save a life and give, give them that extra time. Same with the operations that I do. You know, this patient is definitely going to die. There's a 100% chance of this patient dying if they don't have an operation. If they do have an operation, there's a 50% chance of them dying. So what would you go for if you were in, if, you, if your doctor came to you and said, you can either, you know, we can relieve your pain, tuck you up in bed and leave you to die peacefully, or we can give you a 50-50 chance of um, living and having a, a, a good quality of life for another another 10 years. Yeah, you know, most people would go for the 50-50, wouldn't you? And, and that's, you know, I'm in that situation quite often in my emergency surgery. I think life is very precious. I mean, you can't mm-hmm. praise God when you're dead. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I've never come across serious suffering, so I'm not one to be passing from it, really. But to me, I would want to err on the side of trying to give a reasonable quality of life to prolong it where possible. The other element that bothers me is not where the law is now, but if this country runs into a serious financial situation where uh, elderly people, you've got to choose between caring for elderly people and caring for children and so on. Um, And I've done a lot of Holocaust education, so my whole mindset about euthanasia is very much coloured by what happened in the 30s and 40s. Mm. Well, that's a very important point, and for that, I'll I'll now tell you my opinion, for that same reason, I am against euthanasia being made legal in the Mm. UK, because of it, the risk of it being abused, Um, you know, on the basis of, you know, this this person (coughs) is is 85, they've got the dementia, they've not got any useful thing to give the country, all they're doing is a drain on resources. And um, well, let's let's finish them off, and, and and we can put the resources into younger people. You know, I think that's a very dangerous uh, approach. Situation is very different, though. My mother had um, uh, something or other of the aorta gone. The word is when it's aneurysm. An, an aneurysm of the aorta, and she was ninety. Mm-hmm. We rushed her to the hospital, and. Um, they did a lot of work on her and then uh, they uh, let her sleep and things and, and came to us to say she's just had another um, attack and uh, shall we do anything? And I said no. And that was the right decision? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that was the right decision and, and there are, you know, don't get me wrong, there for every person I do the operation to try and save their life, there's probably another one who I say, you know, there is yeah. no prospect of you surviving this operation. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, I don't think an operation is the right thing. We have that difficult discussion with the family. Um, 
and just as you had and, and I'm sure that was the right decision for her but it's difficult isn't it yeah. there isn't a right or wrong answer and that we, we may all draw our lines differently um, <coughs> I'm going to finish now I was going to tell you my story but I, I won't um, let me just go on, go on. Go on. <laughs> are, are you okay for five minutes okay all right, I'll go then. <laughs> um, <coughs> so this is my family. I'm the handsome guy on the right. And uh, mum and dad had six children. And Ben uh, is, or Benji as he was in, in those days, the little one on, on mum's knee. And when, when Ben was about seven, mum got breast cancer. So she had six children all living at home and she was diagnosed with a life-threatening condition and you can imagine uh, what that did to our family. I was about 14 at the time. I, I wanted to be a doctor from the, when I was about six and I, when I was 14 mum had breast cancer. I didn't know what cancer was and uh, you can imagine the effects it would have had on us as a family. We were very well blessed because here is mum at my 40th birthday um, and, and Ben is holding her in, in his arms and uh, that was about a year before she died. She died of breast cancer eventually but she had 20 years or so um, that she lived with breast cancer and, and the problems um, and so she died a number of years ago now and um, 10 years in fact and uh, when she was dying you know, it, was, it was only the last few months that was, was horrible but it was horrible and there was a lot of suffering um, we thought she would want to die at home and she thought she would want to die at home but when it came to it she didn't want to die at home and she went into a hospice and she was looked after by nurses who were specialists in, in and she was a nurse and uh, she was looked after by nurses who specialised in palliative care and she was so happy or there was such a relief for her being cared for by people who knew what they were doing um, and to the end she was more bothered about the problems that the nurses were having at their, in their family <laughs> lives uh, than she was about herself, that was just the way she was. Um, and I, when mum was dying, I was able to talk to mum about we, you know, we did, we read the Bible together, and we talked about her death, and we talked about the resurrection, and we talked about how wonderful it would be. And uh, the last but one time I saw mum, uh, I thought it was going to be the last time, and she thought it was going to be the last time. And we said our goodbyes, and I said I'll see you in the kingdom. And then as often happens in these situations things don't quite go as according to plan and I came back to see her a few days later because she was still alive and she just said to me what are you doing <laughs> we've already said our goodbye but you know things don't always um, end up as they do in the films um, but uh, you know we were able to talk about her death and the hope that we shared and she kept her faith to the end and, and yeah, as a junior doctor I, I vividly remember going into a a side room where there was a, a person dying and all the family was sat around and I, all I was doing was putting in a drip and giving them some pain relief but this poor man was dying and he knew he was dying and the family all knew he was dying and yet they kept talking about when we get you home dad we're going to cook you the best meal you've ever seen and, and we're going to take you to watch Nottingham Forest play and if you really want to do that, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> um, the point is they, they couldn't talk about death. They couldn't be honest about death. Because to them, that was the end. And, and, and what a terrible thing that is. Um, and it is difficult to talk about death. And when you go home today, it will be difficult for you to talk to each other about death. But maybe we should. Because death is not the end to us. So it, if anyone can talk about death, it should be us. And perhaps we should talk to our partners about how, you know, what we would want if we were in that situation. 
we have a wonderful example in the Lord Jesus, don't we, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And of course, when we're going through the terrible suffering, it's so easy just to think about the suffering and, and it's difficult to get our minds beyond that. But if we can get our minds beyond that, like Jesus did, and think about the hope and the joy that we have to share in the kingdom. And yes, the suffering of this life is terrible and I, I must say that when I have given this talk and asked people to stand where they feel comfortable, there is often a very strong group of people who are standing in the euthanasia camp because they've been there and they've seen someone suffering and they don't want to go suffer themselves. And that might and that might be right for them, and and I'm not I'm not trying to say it's wrong. Um, but for me, uh, at the moment, where I am at the moment, I don't believe God will give us more suffering than we can bear, um, and I don't believe that we've resi- um, you know we haven't been through the suffering that the Lord Jesus has been through. Um, we have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. And, and we do know that God is in control. We could look at the example of Job, who prayed to, to die, um, and that's a very real example. But of course, he didn't take his life. He he let God be in control, and of course, he didn't die at, at that point, and he he was restored to uh, prosperity and fortune and so forth. Um, but you know, Job very much prayed that, that he, he would die. Uh, Job 3 verse 3 Let the day perish wherein I was born and the night in which it was said there is a man child conceived. Um, you know he really he didn't want to carry on living. Um, and yet he had the patience. So in James it, it talks about uh, behold, behold we count them happy which endure second bullet point down. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have, have seen the end of the Lord that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy um, and I, I, I do believe that God doesn't uh, put us through more than, than we can uh, bear Revelation 21 verse 4 of course tells us about the the kingdom to come and the tears that we shed in this life will be no more for it says and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away and I'll just leave you with this um, verse uh, oh, sorry um, from John chapter 14 verse 27 peace I leave with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you let not your hearts be troubled uh, neither let them be afraid and and dying can be peaceful um, and that's me and my mum and uh, yeah, death is a terrible thing but isn't it going to be so wonderful mm-hmm. in the kingdom mm-hmm. when we're reunited Thank you very much.